Can our current tech infrastructure handle the influx of data that we're experiencing? The interesting part about that, we're actually stretching the bounds of things. And uh, there's a pattern in the big data space, which I've been calling the digital shoebox, right? And the idea is, if you get to a point where the cost to acquire a store is less than the perceived latent value of the data, you can reach an incredible tipping where you just throw stuff at it. But in order to do it, we really have to push the tech to get it as cheap as possible, be able to get the compute next to the data. So, uh, As someone who's been building database and data systems for decades, it really is an exciting time. So what tools and systems are we going to need? Yeah, great question. So, I, a lot of it, I think, is about um, things that Doug touched on, things that I touched on this morning in the keynote, the, the ability to basically reduce the time to insight, uh, not have to model things up front. Um, because I think we, before we used to build models to solve a particular set of questions we had in mind up front. Now the ability to defer that, um, so the tooling that we get in terms of scaling, the, the tooling we get in terms of just being able to query over anything, and then if that query, the answer to that, serves to be value, we can spend and invest to repeat it and make it faster and whatnot. Right. So. Query over everything. I like query that. over that's, everything. That's a nice approach to it. Now, shifting gears a little bit, how do you see data marketplaces evolving over the next few years? Yeah. Are they going to be sort of the primary area for data discovery? You know, I think it's about this. It's, um, if you think about combining various aspects of data, if you go look at you know, the data scientists today, Quite often, they're going out to try to find things, and it's just reference data to connect certain classes of things, and um, there's just so much friction in going off and doing that. So I think it'll be a mixture of private, uh, public, and commercial data, um, and it'll get remade. And in fact, if you look at the financial data feeds that the big financial services house consume, that has shifted up tremendously in the last 10 to 15 years. And if you just see about that playing out in general and in the large, I think that's how you'll see it, see it go. So last question for you. Uh, what is ambient data? And how, how do you see people putting it to use over the next couple okay, of years? So ambient data is a term I started to use a couple of years ago. And I started to use it because when I entered a conversation with many people talking about big data, they were only thinking of that dimension, volume, right? Uh, and people are a little bit more savvy now, but at that point, I started to talk about it's ambient data. It's, we no longer have to type it in. It's just available. We're all walking around you know, sensor networks and whatnot. So the way I say it is the cost of data acquisition has gone to zero. And like, you can still pay people to type stuff in, and it's like roughly a dollar a kilobyte. Mm -hmm. So that's like a buck ten for the Gettysburg Address. It's like a thousand bucks for Moby Dick. And if you scale it up to a petabyte, it's an awful lot of money. But sure. now we just get petabytes, it's just available for free if we can turn it into value. Well, thanks so much for being with us. Appreciate you taking the time. Certainly.